and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Oh my, how do I love making these recordings of the reading The Secret History of the Jesuits, this fantastic book by Edmond Paris, and surely as I today have a wonderful guest from the United States of America, from Romerica, a mm. carpenter, my dear friend and brother in Christ, Brett Norman. Still on the twenty, uh, on the nineteenth of March, two thousand seventeen. Now an hour later than the first recording, because we split this in two, because this was so intense. Brett, welcome again, and thank you very much for joining me in our reading together of the book *The Secret History of the Jesuits* by Edmond Paris. Say hello. To our hello, listeners. hello. <laughs> yes, thank you, Yerk, and uh, I really appreciate your reading these books and uh, sharing your thoughts on them, and uh, and I hope your listeners appreciate it as well. And you know, I wish I had more time to dedicate to uh, the readings myself, and uh, I sometime would like to do that, but at at the moment, I'm just engaged in in working with you and making videos and doing photos and doing what I can to protest the Antichrist of the Bible. You know, we are all part of the body of Christ, and not everybody can be a hand, not everybody can be a foot, not everybody can be a mouth, not everybody can be an eye, not everybody can be an ear. Everybody does his function. You are doing your job the best way that you can, working for the Holy Spirit, and I am doing the best to my capabilities. And Tom is doing his best to his capabilities. And all together, we resemble the body of Christ. Indeed we do. So when now, for the moment, you don't have the time to do this and to do that, the work that you are doing, Brett, I can tell you, is very much appreciated. You, you put together the uh, intro and the outro to the videos of this book reading that I'm doing. You are searching all the pictures for my readings of All Roads Lead to Rome, which is, of course, when this one will be published, this video here, is already long history and published mm. on my channel. But for the mm -hmm. moment, you are still doing that. I'm, 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 I'm waiting for the pictures it. of chapter 14 and 15 and the others to come until chapter 21. And you are doing so many other things, looking for books on the internet, uh, ordering books for Tom and for me, for what I am very grateful. For example, that wonderful book from, a, uh, from James Edgar Wiley, the history of yeah. Protestantism, that one volume mm. that I have here already, and the other books that you sent me, the whole Catholic Encyclopedia from 1911. Wonderful. That's right. So That's we, every, right. We, we, we all do our part in the work of the body of Christ. That's right. That's absolutely right. And, and just as uh, it's a wonderful thing to see uh, the the readings continue because uh, it's comprehension, comprehending uh, the history, comprehending the Bible, comprehending uh, our role as uh, interactive people um, trying to access God's Spirit, actually being interactive with the body of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And... Yep. Uh, in this ever-changing world we live in today, and as uh, as adulterated as it is, and here we have the Jesuits. Speaking of adulteration, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very fittingly. Uh, mm, so I'm yes. going to continue reading in section four, chapter three, the eclipse of the company. This is a part of the book that takes about six pages on my PDF. And I see that we get through it, but I know that there will be comments. You know, I didn't prepare the comments, but I know the Holy Spirit will lead me into always adding something to what the author maybe missed or did not know or whatever. I will do my comments whenever I please. And of course, Brett, you will interrupt mm. me with comment when you have a comment there. Will do. And then we can discuss this a little bit. Thank you very yes. much, Brett, for taking the time to come on the broadcast here and uh, do this uh, wonderful book reading with me together so that when you don't have the time to read a whole chapter of any book that you want for yourself and make a video of it, at least you are a guest on my readings 
and your voice will be heard too. Thank you very much, Eric. Let's go. The Eclipse of the Company. The successes of the Society of Jesus obtained in Europe and far off lands, even though inter interspersed by some misfortunes, assured it a preponderant situation for a long time. But as we have already mentioned, time was not working in its favor. As ideas evolved and the process, uh, progress of sciences tended to liberate the minds, ordinary people and monarchs found it more and more difficult to endure the ascendancy of these champions of theocracy. Didn't you just look up the word theocracy on the internet, uh, Brad? I did, yes. And theocracy, if you look it up, definition is a noun, a system of government in which priests rule in the name of God or a God with little g. Yeah. The Commonwealth of Israel from the time of Moses until the election of Saul as king is the uh, just underneath that. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting word for sure. And basically the way I interpret it is, you know, we all have doctrine. We are taught doctrine from a, a standpoint of, of uh, just going to school. Having someone teach you, that's doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. So we're forced to a doctrine. And uh, we've been indoctrinated. And uh, the doctrine of this world is not Christ's doctrine, is it? No, and I think that we just have to consider that theocracy in, uh, in this terms, as it is written here in this book, has to be understood as the rule of the Roman Catholic Church, the rule of the spiritual over the temporal. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is a theocracy, where that the spiritual is, is put above the temporal. I don't have any problem with that uh, if that is done biblically. As you say, it was mentioned in that uh, part that you looked up, that it was before the Israelites chose a king, the time they were living under God as their king, yeah, mm -hmm. that that was That's kind right. of a theocracy. I would the not time have, of Moses, mm -hmm. yeah, the time of Moses. I would not have any problem with that kind of theocracy. I do have a problem with the theocracy of today, where a man elevates himself to God and by that rules the whole world, which is the Antichrist of the Bible, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Pope, the papacy the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, when he establishes his theocracy on this earth, then I do have a problem with it. Okay, continuing in the book. Also, many abuses born out of its successes impaired the society inwardly. Apart from politics in which it was deeply involved, as one has seen, to the detriment of national interests, of course, as we knew from you know, you remember the quote from the Polish uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs between 1932 and, uh, and the Second World War, when he said that he only understood too late that the foreign policy of his nation, Poland, did not serve the national interests of Poland, but did serve the interests of the Roman Catholic Church. That was in one of the earlier readings of this book that we read that and you over there in the United States of America should at a certain moment all wake up and see that your foreign policy, foreign politics does not serve the national interest, does not serve the interest of the protestant people of the United States of America but it only serves the Antichrist. Anyway, I start the sentence again. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for that little comment here. It's good. Apart from politics in which it was deeply involved, as one has seen, to the detriment of national interests, and that goes for Europe and Germany and all the other countries, the same as for America. So I'm not bashing America. I'm just pointing out the reality of the Antichrist system, 
Its devouring activity had soon made itself felt in the domain of economics. The fathers became involved too much in affairs which had nothing to do with religion. In commerce, in exchange, as liquidators of bankruptcies, the Roman college, which should have remained the intellectual and moral model of all Jesuit colleges, had cloth made in huge quantities at Maserata and sold it in fairs at a low price. Their centers in India, the Antilles, Mexico and Brazil soon started trading in colonial products. At Martinique, a procurator created vast plantations which were cultivated by Negro slaves. This is the commercial side of foreign missions which is just the same today. Now, what does the Bible say about Jesuit involvement in commerce? We read Revelation chapter 18 verse 23. Listen closely. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Unquote. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. Let me tell you one thing. The last 10 years, the whole world is speaking about the fantastic opportunities that will arise for all our little, uh, all us little people, little consumers, when we embrace the globalistic idea. Globalism leads an economy to monopoly to uh, monopolies and uh, if someone holds a monopoly on something a monopoly on something i think i use the right word in the english expression mm -hmm. right brad yep yeah? yep okay. that's right if someone holds a monopoly on something then you as the user you as the consumer have nothing to say anymore you totally depend on the producer mm -hmm. today all the big companies on this earth let it be Coca-Cola, let it be Monsanto, let it be Mercedes-Benz, let it be Ford, let it be, I don't know, name them, name any company. And you go to the top of them, you will see that the people who are put out as quote-unquote the owners or quote-unquote the CEOs, are all people who are in one or another way related whether to Freemasonry or related to papal knighthoods. Like for example, the founder of Monsanto was a knight of Malta. And we know that the knights of Malta are controlled by the Jesuits. And Freemasonry is also controlled on the top by the Jesuits. And that is why I say Revelation 18.23 For thy merchants were the great men of the earth is a reflection of what the Jesuits are with their economics today, 2017. And even the time when Edmond Paris wrote this book, which was published in 1975, and even before, because we are speaking here about the 17th and 18th century. Do you agree with me, Brett? Do you maybe have oh, some, yes. some, uh, some comment on that, or shall I continue? Just keep going. Yep, continue, please. The Roman Church never scorned at extracting a temporal profit from her spiritual conquests. As far as that is concerned, the Jesuits were just like all other religious orders. They even surpassed them. In any case, we know that recently the White Fathers were amongst the richest landowners in North Africa. And I think this must read North America. And that is a mistake in the printing here. I don't know. This comment that it must actually probably read North America is in the German version. 
but mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense to me that we speak of white fathers who were amongst the richest landowners in North Africa. I think that must read North America. Anyway, the sons of Loyola were as, insten uh, were as intensely active at making the best of the pagans' labors as at winning their souls. And we read about that, of course, with, for example, uh, you remember the reductions of Paraguay already. But here we have another quote. In Mexico, they had silver mines and sugar refineries. In Paraguay, tea and cacao plantations, carpet factories. They also reared cattle and exported 80,000 mules every year. Unquote. As we can see, the evangelization of their red children was a good source of revenue. And to make an even bigger profit, the fathers did not hesitate to defraud the state treasury, as seen in the well-known story of the so-called boxes of chocolate unloaded at Cadi, which were full of gold powder. Bishop Palafox, sent as apostolic visitor by Pope Innocent um, the Tenth, because this is a fault, uh, it says in the book Pope Innocent VIII, but Pope Innocent VIII was living in the 15th century and that was not the time of Bishop Palafox. So we have to change this to Pope Innocent X. Bishop Palafox, sent as apostolic visitor by Pope Innocent X, wrote to him in 1647, quote, All the wealth of South America is in the hands of the Jesuits. Unquote. This is just a confirmation of the reductions of Paraguay, or reducciones of Paraguay, as we read earlier in this book. You know, Paraguay was much bigger at that time. Today it covers the land of Paraguay, Brazil, and uh, even another state, I don't know which one, Venezuela, I think, for a big part mm. also, that was just called Paraguay in the 16th and 17th century when the Jesuits installed their reductions, or concentration camps, you can also know them. Mm -hmm. Financial affairs were just as advantageous. In Rome, the coffers of the order made payments to the Portuguese embassy in the name of the Portuguese government. When August, the first, uh, August Lefort went to Poland, Vienna's fathers opened a credit account for this needy monarch with the Jesuits of Varsovie. In China, the fathers lent money to the merchants at 25, 50, and even 100% interest. Compare that to what the Federal Reserve asks today. <laughs> mm -hmm, <man. laughs> to indebt us all more, to indebt us all more, they leave the interest, yeah? mm. but therefore everybody will go more into debt. The fathers lent money to China at 25, 50 and even 100% interest. The scandalous greediness of the order, its loose morals, its ceaseless political intrigues and also its encroachings upon the prerogatives of the secular and regular clergy had stirred up mortal enmity and hatred everywhere. Amongst the higher classes it had been brought into complete disrepute and, in France, at any rate, its efforts to maintain the people in a formalist and superstitious piety gave way to the inevitable emancipation of the minds. Nevertheless, the material prosperity enjoyed by the society, the acquired positions at the courts and especially the support of the Holy See, which they thought immovable, maintained the Jesuits in their complete assurance, even on the eve of their ruin. Had they not already gone through several storms, suffered through thirty expulsions from the time of their foundation until the middle of the 18th century? Nearly every time they had been back sooner or later to reoccupy their lost positions. But this new eclipse threatening them was to be nearly total this time and last for more than 40 years. The strange thing is that the first assault against the powerful society came from the very Catholic Portugal, one of their principal strongholds in Europe. The influence exercised over that country by England since the beginning of the century was probably one of the causes of its uprising. 
a treaty fixing the boundaries in America concluded between Spain and Portugal in 1750, had given the Portuguese a vast territory east of the river Uruguay, where the Jesuits were working. The Paraguayan reductions. In consequence, the fathers had to retreat with their converts on this side of the new frontier on Spanish territory. So they armed their Guaranis, led a long guerrilla war and finally remained masters of the land which was given back to Spain. The Marquess of Pombal, Portuguese Prime Minister, felt really insulted. Besides, this former pupil of the Jesuits had not kept their trademark and drew his inspiration from French and English philosophers rather than from his old educators. In 1757 he drove out the Jesuit confessors of the royal family and forbade the members of the society to preach. After several quarrels with them, he issued pamphlets to the public, one of which was quote, short account of the Jesuits' kingdom in Paraguay, unquote, which made a great noise, obtained an inquiry into their conduct by Pope Benedict XIV, and finally banished the society from all his territories. The affair caused a sensation in Europe, and especially in France, where soon after the bankruptcy of Father Lavalette broke out, he was a businessman handling huge transactions in sugar and coffee for the company. Father La Valette. Now, if you want any more information on Father La Valette, go to a bookstore and get the book Code Word Barbalon, Danger in the Vatican by P. D. Stewart, Part 1. I started reading that book as I read so many books at the same time. I'm at about page 60 or 65 for the moment, and I can tell you the beginning is very interesting, because in that book, Code Word Babylon, there is proof that the Jesuit order had to make open their constitutions, which were often assaulted before that time and at that time as, quote-unquote, conspiracy theories. But because of that bankruptcy of Father Lavalette, when he was taken to court, he, um, he leaned on the constitutions of the Jesuits for his doing. And therefore the court ordered the constitutions of the Jesuits to made public to them, to the court. And that was done. And that you can read in the book, Code Word Babylon. So the author here does not go too deep into that, but I just could not stop to tell you about that, that reading this different kind of books really helps you to see the grand picture in the end. Father Lavalette, he was a businessman handling huge transactions in sugar and coffee for the company. The company is actually the company de Jesus, the Jesuits, the company of Jesus. But of course, do not forget, they also found another trading company, the East Indian Trading Company. It's all the same roots. Its refusal to pay the father's debts was fatal. So the Jesuits retracted their support for Father Lavalette, who was dealing for them in huge transactions in sugar and coffee. So he was brought to trial, and in that trial he was uh, pressed to, or the Jesuits were pressed to, make known their constitutions. Its refusal to pay the father's debts was fatal. The parliament, not content with the civil condemnation, examined its constitutions, well that's exactly what I just told you, declared its establishment in France illegal and condemned 24 works of its principal authors. On the 6th of April 1762, it issued a statement of arrest, means an indictment, in the following terms. Quote, the said institute is inadmissible and in any civilized state as its nature is hostile to all spiritual and temporal authority. It seeks to introduce into the church and states under the plausible veil of a religious institute, not an order truly desirous to spread evangelical perfection, listen good, 
but rather a political body working untiringly at usurping all authority by all kinds of indiscreet, secret and devious means. Unquote. In conclusion, the Jesuits' doctrine was described as follows, quote, perverse and destroyer of all religious and honest principles, insulting to Christian morals, pernicious to civil society, hostile to the rights of the nation, the royal power, and even the security of the sovereigns and obedience of their subjects, suitable to stir up the greatest disturbances in the states, conceive and maintain the worst kind of corruption in men's hearts. Unquote. In France, the society's properties were confiscated for the benefit of the crown, and none of its members was allowed to stay in the kingdom unless he renounced his vows and swore to submit to the general rules of France's clergy. Now, what have we just read? Once the constitutions of the Jesuit order were made public, the people could see that the Jesuits' doctrine was a perverse doctrine. It was a destroyer of all religious and honest principles, insulting to Christian morals, pernicious to civil society, hostile to the rights of the nation, the royal power and even the security of the sovereigns and obedience of their subjects. And then banning the Jesuit order from France and pressing the people to renounce their vows, the people of the Society of Jesus, and submit to the general rules of France's clergy and confiscated all the society's properties, that lets me think of a repetition of the year 1307 because you know on Friday the 13th 1307 the Templars in France were arrested and the Templars were just the precursors of the Jesuits or the Jesuits are just the revived Knights Templars and what happened to them in 1307 is here happening in France again in the 17th century, in 1762, a few years before 1773, the Pope, which we will come to a little later on in this reading, banished the Jesuit order. You have any comment here, Brett? Well, it's pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to comment when you're trying to comprehend what you're talking about here. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're a few steps ahead of me, Yerk, and that's fine. <laughs> I don't mean to uh, intrude the listeners, but, uh, you know, it's the truth. Yeah, I'm studying this is, and uh, learning, and this is wonderful, so please continue. Thank you. Okay. In Rome, the Jesuits General Ricci, Lorenzo Ricci, who I talked about extensively during my reading and analyzing and discussing the book Rulers of Evil by Frederick Tupper Saucy, which you can also find in an own playlist on my YouTube channel. In Rome, the Jesuits general Lorenzo Ricci obtained from Pope Clement XIII a bull confirming the order, order's privileges and proclaiming its innocence. But it was too late. In Spain, the Bourbons suppressed all the establishments of the society, the, metropol uh, the metropolitan ones as well as the colonial ones. So that means the European ones as the overseas ones, right? So ended Paraguay's Jesuit state. The reductions of Paraguay came to an end because of what the Bourbons did. The government of Naples, Parma, and even the Grand Master of Malta also banished the sons of Loyola from their territories. 
The 6,000 who were in Spain had a strange experience after they had been thrown in prison. And Tapa Saucy goes into that into more detail in his book. Quote, King Charles III sent all the prisoners to the Pope with a grand letter in which he said that he, quote, put them under the wise and immediate control of your holiness, unquote. But when the wretches were about to disembark at Civita Vecchia, they were welcomed with a thunder of cannon shot under the order of their own general, Lorenzo Ricci, who already had to look after the Portuguese Jesuits and couldn't even feed them. They just managed to find them a wretched sanctuary in Corsica. Corsica is an island in the Mediterranean Sea that is between France and Italy. Now, to go a little bit into this history a little bit more, because it's quite interesting, and you know, <laughs> it should, mm. I should pick up the book Rules of Evil to, to, to read all this, but rather I, I just tell you, uh, go to that book yourself or go to my readings yourself and learn about that, what I commented and, and told you all about the politics of Lorenzo Ricci, because in, to my understanding, the black general Lorenzo Ricci, who reigned between 1758 and an unknown time after 1775, which we will come to a little bit later in this reading, was the most pernicious, the most cruel, and the most intelligent of all the of all the black popes that I have known up to now, that I studied up to now. Because everything that we read here and the doings of the Bourbons and of the King of uh, Portugal and all that stuff, what was all induced by him. He was the one who planned the banishment of the Jesuit order. Because that gave them the possibility to go secular and to come back as two American presidents, ex former American presidents, exchanged in the letters, where the one says, I don't like the appearance of the Jesuits, they come over here in swarms, as only the king of the gypsies can do, in all kinds of distinguishing, like printers and editors and merchants. Help me here, Brett. You know what oh, I'm yes. talking about? <laughs> I do. I know the quote, but I don't have it memorized either. And the point that I'm making is just that yeah. they were, how do you say that? They were changing from being a visible, uh, yeah. almost clerical, sacerdotal Roman Catholic order they were completely privatized, secularized. Mm -hmm. They could hide under every profession. That mm -hmm. today, today, today you do not know if you deal with the Jesuit because he doesn't wear his black priest garment. Yep, he the wears, only way you're going to know is if the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. <laughs> he wears every clothes that he wants. Yes. He is, he is so-called one of us, mm -hmm. you know? Right. And this secularization of, secularization of the order was the plan of Lorenzo Ricci already long time ago. Mm. And he, of course, and, and now people say, well, Jörg, you are, telling, you are telling idiotic things. He would not offer all his people. Of course he would. He doesn't care if these Jesuits could not even be fed, the Portuguese Jesuits he had under his control, or the Spanish Jesuits that were sent and um, uh, into that uh, into that harbor, and um, they found uh, elsewhere a place, as we can re as we can read, they found mm -hmm. wretched sanctuary in Corsica. He doesn't mm -hmm. care about them. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Because the end justifies the means. Yep, and took the words are, out of my mouth. <laughs> and they are all perende a cadaver. Mm -hmm. They are all like 
dead people anyway. And when the Jesuit general says, you go there and you die, they go and they die. Mm. Because they are ordered. Because they have no mind, no conscience of their own. But interesting in this regard to see that they just managed to find them a wretched sanctuary in Corsica. <laughs> now, this little island in the Mediterranean Sea between France and Italy, looking into a connection why Napoleon came from Corsica, Napoleon was born and raised on the island of Corsica. <laughs> to punish for the deeds done against the Jesuit order? Are you looking for a connection why Napoleon came from Corsica to punish for the deeds done against the Jesuit order? Look no further. You found it. That's why Napoleon arose out of Corsica and punished the Franks punished the French with all these wars that he did the most soldiers who died especially when he went against Russia were French soldiers right mm -hmm. leaving them leading them into perdition because Napoleon was a Freemason raised at the time that the Society of Jesus officially was banished but he was under control of the black pope who at that time hid under the guise of the in 1776 founded Illuminati that was just a front organization for the Jesuits to hide behind at the time that they were so called banished from the world the more you read these books the more you will see that for yourself. Mm -hmm. But I found the connection of sending the Jesuits to a wretched sanctuary in Corsica. And then I, all of a sudden the thought came to my mind, well, Napoleon came from Corsica, didn't he? Mm, sure did. And that's just about 30 years later. Mm. So, wow. The book continues, Clement XIII elected on the 6th of July, 1758, and by the way, a pupil of Lorenzo Ricci, who at the same time became the Jesuit general, 1758, had resisted a long time the pressing request for several nations demanding the Jesuits' oppression. He was about to yield and had already arranged a consistory for the 3rd of February, 1769, at which he was to tell the cardinals about his resolution to comply with the wishes of these courts. On the night before that particular day, he suddenly felt ill as he was going to bed and cried out, I am dying. It is a very dangerous thing to attack the Jesuits. A conclave assembled and went on for three months. At last, Cardinal Ganganelli put, the, put on the mitre and took the name of Pope Clement XIV. Ganganelli by the way, that's information from me, was a child risen by Lorenzo Ricci. He was made cardinal by Lorenzo Ricci before. And now he became the successor of Pope Clement XIII and took the name Pope Clement XIV. He was a puppet of Lorenzo Ricci. And the courts which had banished the Jesuits kept on asking for the total suppression of the society, but the papacy was in no hurry to abolish this primordial instrument for the carrying out of its politics, and four years passed before Clement XIV, constrained by the firm attitude of his opponents, who had occupied some of the pontifical, sta pontifical states, at last signed the brief of dissolution, a papal bull, <laughs> under the title Dominus Ac Redemptor. And please, you listener who doubts anything that I say, look it up. And you can find it on every Vatican website for yourself. The papal bull 
Dominus Ac Redemptor. In 1773, Lorenzo Ricci, the Order's General at that time, as I told you, was even imprisoned at the castle of St. Angelo, where he died a few years later, the author says, and I say no! No! He did not die there a few years later. There was a secret passage between the castle St. Angelo and St. Peter's Dome. Check out the book Rulers of Evil, where I even got deeper into this, and you will get a better understanding of this complex situation that I cannot do all the explanation right here in this book reading, but certainly go to the chapter called The Death of and resurrection of Lorenzo Ricci. And you will learn that there are several different historical accounts that link the general Lorenzo Ricci of the Society of Jesus at that time to the professor, a person who was even there at the signing of the What's it called? 1776 Declaration of Independence in ah, the United yes. States of America. Mm -hmm. He was there. And that is historically proven. There is a book called The Flag of Our Fathers or something like that. Don't miss that with, with that film that is made some years ago. That's not it. Oh, It's just called mm -hmm. Our Flag, I think. You will find the reference in Rules of Evil. Check that mm -hmm. out. And there you will see different... Uh, 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 multiple references that this person called the professor which is very deeply spoken of by rulers of evil also by tapa saucy that that could have been no other person than lorenzo ricci who did not die a few years later in castle saint angelo he was in control all the time any comments mm. I only wish I had the the uh, reading in front of me right now so I could quote from it, but I don't. So, What reading? You mean uh, Rulers of Evil? Yeah, I got the book, but uh, I'm a little slow. <laughs> oh, it's uh, The Death and Resurrection of Lorenzo Ricci. It must be chapter 19 or something, I think. Right, right. Uh, I'm not yep. quite sure about that, but I think that's it. But, yep. well... To my listeners and viewers, just check out my playlist of Rulers of Evil. You will find that. And uh, when you yep. open any of the readings I did uh, in the description box of all the videos, there are several links where you can download the book for free from the Internet and educate yourself. Please study for yourself. Find out the truth for yourself. It is not because Brett says it or I say it or anybody else says it that it is true. The only mm -hmm. truth that you can accept when you doubt anything that I say here anyway is the truth that you find out for yourself. So do your own studies. I can only help to put you maybe in the right direction where you can find that. So the author continues, the Jesuits only appear to submit to this verdict which condemned them. They wrote innumerable pamphlets against the Pope and to incite rebellion. They told lies and slanders without number concerning so-called atrocities committed when their properties in Rome were confiscated. The death of Clement XIV, 14 months later, was even attributed to them by a section of European opinion. There are some very famous words that Pope Clement XIV said before he died, but we will come to that a bit, little bit later, I guess. The Jesuits, in principle at, le at least, were no more. But Clement XIV knew very well that by signing their death warrant, he was signing his own as well. This suppression is done at last, he exclaimed, and I am not sorry about it. I would do it again if it was not done already. But this suppression will kill me. Ganganelli was right. Soon, posters started to appear on the palace walls, which invariably displayed these five letters. I-S-S-S-V. And everyone wondered what it meant. You know, this reminds me of the handwriting on the wall in Daniel's book. <laughs> Mene mene tekel ufarsen. Your days are numbered, right? 
Right. I S S S V. And everyone wondered what it meant, but Clement understood immediately and boldly declared it means in September Sarah Sede Vacante. Meaning in English, in September the seat or the sea will be vacant means that the Pope will be dead. Here is another testimony. Pope Ganganelli did not survive long after the Jesuits' suppression, said Scipion de Ricci, probably a relative to Lorenzo, de Ricci, to Lorenzo Ricci, this Scipion de Ricci. I couldn't find him on the internet, I just assumed that. Mm. Quote from Scipion de Ricci. The account of his illness and death sent to the court of Madrid by the minister of Spain and Rome proved that he had been poisoned. As far as we know, no inquiry was held concerning this event by the cardinals, nor the new pontiff. The perpetrator of that abominable deed was then able to escape the judgment of the world, but he will not be able to escape God's justice." Unquote. We can positively affirm, another quote continues, that on the 22nd of September 1774, Pope Clement XIV died by poisoning. Unquote. Meanwhile, the Empress of Austria, Marie Therese, had also banished the Jesuits from all her states. Only Frederick of Prussia and Catherine II, Empress of Russia, welcomed them in their countries as educators. But in Prussia, they only managed to stay for 10 years until 1786. Russia was favorable to them longer, but there also, and for the same reason, they eventually aroused the animosity of the government. The suppression of the schism and the rallying of Russia to the Pope attracted them like a lamp attracts a moth. They launched an active propaganda program in the army and aristocracy, uh, and aristocracy and fought against the Bible society created by the Tsar. They won several successes and converted Prince Galitzin, uh, nephew of the Minister of, for Worship. <laughs> they had even a Minister for Worship. Uh, separation of church and state. So the Tsar invented and we uh, intervened, sorry, so the Tsar intervened and we have the UKs of the 20th of December 1815. Now what's a UKs? That is an edict of the Russian government. No need to say that the grounds for this UKs, which banished the Jesuits from St. Petersburg and Moscow, were the same as in all the other countries. Quote, we came to realize that they did not fulfill the duties expected of them. Instead of living as peaceful inhabitants in a foreign country, they disturbed the Greek religion, meaning the Orthodox religion, which has been since ancient times the predominant religion in our empire and on which, the, uh, on which rests the peace and happiness of the nation under our scepter. They abused the confidence they obtained and turned the youth entrusted to them and inconsistent woman away from our worship. We are not surprised that this religious order was expelled from every country and that their actions were not tolerated anywhere. Unquote. In 1820 at last, general measures were taken to drive them out of the whole of Russia. But because of political events favoring it, they had set foot again in Western Europe when their order was solemnly re-established by evil Antichrist Pope Pius VII in 1814. The political significance of this decision is clearly expressed by M. Daniel Robbs, a great friend of the Jesuits. He wrote concerning the reappearance of the sons of Loyola, quote, it was impossible not to see in and uh, it was impossible not to see in it an obvious act of counter revolution unquote. counter revolution the jesuits are counter reformation the jesuits have one goal only and that is to reinstall the pope to the glory, 
before the Reformation came. And of course the Pope will be one of their choice, as is Pope Francis today. It was impossible not to see in it an obvious act of counter-revolution. Of course this order was founded for revolution, was founded as a military order, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, the Church at War. This was the counter-reformation, Satan's chess set against Jesus to kill the word of God in the world in which he will never ever succeed. And how do I know that? Because I know the Bible and I know who's going to win. And I know that Jesus, the creator, is much more powerful than any created being. And Satan is just a created being. And we are just a created being. So we better humbly serve our master, the one who created us and who gave us laws how to deal with each other and with him in this world. Ten commandments, all ten of them, and not listening to any sacerdotal Roman Catholic or any other order or any other man, any priest, any bishop, any cardinal, any pope, any antichrist, but listening to Jesus Christ. Brett, some finishing comments? Oh, just got a smile on my face. That was a good conclusion to this chapter. I think that, uh, yes, uh, there's just so much to think about here. <laughs> it renders me speechless. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, I know that um, you were planning of reading that book for yourself online. And, uh mm hmm it uh, didn't quite turn out that easy to do this and uh, no no it is it is not easy and i think that a year or two uh, um, uh, before this time so a, a, year, a year or two ago I, I would not be in the possibility to read it as i'm reading it right now it is um, a very hard book and the more history that you've learned already the easier the book comes you know? That's true. That's really the, that is the case of it. And and that's what I'm thinking, you know, I was thinking earlier today that, you know, looking at this uh, prophecy, the 1260 days, prophetic days, three and a half months, and, 42 months, uh, yes, three and a half years, and, 42 months. Yes. And, you know, just to consider that principle alone is a big step in the right direction. Now, <clears throat> you get into the, the uh, you know, the, the idea that uh, we were talking about in the last chapter about those 42 prophetic months, 1260 days, that being different from the, uh, the common teaching that's been shown to us of, uh, what was it, five... 598 or no, I'm getting that wrong. Uh, 538 to 1798. 38. Yes, yes, yeah. 38. But uh, I think the important thing to take home is uh, <clears throat> just starting to, you know, come to the realization that uh, indeed there is some real truth to the prophecy. And uh, that the 42 prophetic months or 1260 days is spoken of in several places. I can't list them off the top of my head. 1260 years, yeah. yeah, it yeah was, 1260 years. It, yeah. it was spoken in the, in the prophecies of Daniel and in mm -hmm. the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. so Daniel well, you have John. the year for day principle, right? And, yeah, and, uh, that was established in Ezekiel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes. But, I mean, it's such a huge departure from your common 
churched person. They they just, you know, you start talking about something like that and they they just have a real hard time coming to that realization. Uh, it's definitely, you know, if we can get someone in the ballpark, at least look at it and consider it, you know, mm. uh, that's, that's a step in the right direction. That's all I'm saying, you know, and, you know, like you say, Yerk, you got to research it yourself. You got to read it yourself. You got to think about it. You got to talk to others about it. Maybe, I don't know. And you got to ask the Holy Spirit for direction. There we go. That's right. And then things start happening. You know, if we let the Holy Spirit and the history through the Bible teach us a new truth, you know, and let go of that old self that has just been plagued with problems, you know, that's what I'm finding for my own walk, you know, and I can openly share that, you know, that we really need to think about, you know, why is, is this corruption, you know, where does it stem from? Well, it stems from misinterpreting the Bible and forcing that down the throats of your fellow people. And that's what we have. Do you know why there are so many misinterpretations of the Bible in the world today, Brett? Well, <laughs> I would imagine that it's a lot of power. Well, a lot of power that can be the harnessed. Answer, the answer that I can think of of this question, which is not an easy question, is very simple. Mm. Because there are so many corrupted, forged Bibles in the world. There we go. Yes. And when you do not have the correct word of God, you are not led with the interpretation by the Holy Spirit but by another spirit. So how many spirits are directing all the people who are reading all this different, perverted, corrupted Bible versions? Mm. They are mm. looking for a spirit and a spirit all will also will come into them, but it is not mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. That's because right. they do not have the correct word of God. Big difference. A very big, big difference. difference. Yes. You know, the Lord said the world will pass, time will pass, the world will pass, everything will pass, but my words will not pass. That's right. <laughs> but his words, he spoke only once because God is not a God of repetition. And his words were penned down by men who were ordained by the Holy Spirit to understand God's word and pen them down, these words were written down once. And man did not copy these words, but forged these words, altered these words, took away, added to, and sold that to the people out there as the word mm. of God. Mm -hmm. And of course, with this confusion... The readers are confused mm -hmm. and will rather follow their own interpretation or an interpretation induced to them by a spirit, which I'm sorry to say for everyone who does not adhere to the King James Bible, is not the Holy Spirit. And that is why we have so many different interpretations of all that stuff and so many different understandings. I mean, you have to understand, Brett, The people mm -hmm. are always even willing to die for their belief. Mm -hmm. Even though their belief is the wrong one. Mm -hmm. and, oh, sure. And I will go back to another little, uh, not quote, because I cannot cite that from heart, but I can give you the idea of the book reading that I'm reading right now, um, the uh, next to this one, The History of the Inquisition. Speaking about Socrates, the Greek, in the time of the Grecian Empire, who was ready to sacrifice his life for his belief system and who actually died for it. He was persecuted and he died for his belief system because he was so convinced that his truth was the real truth. 
and he didn't even know the Bible. He didn't even know the God of the Bible. He didn't even know the real truth. But he was so convinced of it that he was ready to die for it. And so are many people in the system that we are living. And that is why the words of Jesus Christ will come to fruition, that they think they will do God's work when they persecute us, real Bible-believing Christians. And mm -hmm. with this, I want to end the broadcast, Brett. I want to thank you very right. much for turning up again the second time this evening to accompany in this reading. Do we have any closing remarks to our listeners? All I hope to be back soon. And uh, thanks for inviting me, Jörg. It's my pleasure. Always my pleasure, Brett, to have you on the broadcast. And to my listeners, again, the last time, for this video at least, my sincere request, do your own research. And you will see that the truth that you seek out for yourself and you, that you will find with the help of the 1611 authorized version King James Bible and your history studies that you do based on the knowledge of the prophecies made in that Bible and the understanding that you get of this is the only truth that you are prepared to accept without problem. So until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off. God bless you and bye bye. A specialized work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day. Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits, if you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, throughout all this time, President Reagan 
has come to fulfill the greatest uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.